Great. So welcome to the Friends Hang Out on a Patio and Ask Each Other Questions podcast. Is it ep- What episode is it? It's episode one. Okay. For me, yeah. personally. Yeah. Well, this is your podcast, obviously. Yeah. This, yeah. I actually, I got all of this together <laughs> and invited you over because I think you're a really interesting person. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me on. Totally. It was, it's, you know, a pleasure yeah. to be here, Ty. Well, it's great. And um, it's a sunny day. There's obviously a lot of vibes coming to the satellite i can feel the energy <laughs> just all coming down on us right now i think we're like tapping into some frequencies <laughs> we're getting sent some information um and and hopefully it'll help kind of facilitate some you know some vibes for the, yeah. for the podcast out here and before we start i just want to thank um also erin cartoonzy for letting us use her backyard yeah um, it's definitely a beautiful out here wouldn't be the same without you know this yard erin so thank you yeah thank you um shout out to these mosquitoes too shout out to the mosquitoes so in tucson right now we're having like a mosquito hawk infestation if you didn't notice oh like the big ones yeah. with the okay yeah <laughs> with the wings that are just like flying around everywhere yeah it's it's been a little wild because they just for some, i've noticed this they want to come in your house mm-hmm. they'll like hang out on your window trying to get in any chance they have and and i, I thought about it for a little bit because i'm super woke and i was like maybe they want to get in because it's cooler or there's shade no they want to get in because they know they can breed inside oh. safely because because they're hunted by other things like spiders and stuff outside and all these different things it's harder for them to create outdoors so they know if they get inside it's easier for them to create so well, that, that was my idea at least oh so you don't know that for, i don't know you don't really know that no, you're I, just okay yeah, it was an idea i was my next question was <laughs> should we be scared are they dangerous well yeah let's actually just overlook coronavirus and go straight to mosquito hawks could be what's next in tucson they could be bringing our population down different yeah whole other rungs down to what it used to be before what's the donut place opening now the new one not not irene's not i literally couldn't tell you i'm actually kind of surprised (laughs) that there's another donut shop happening are you serious i know it's a guy from la and he i just read the interview he was like i can't wait to come to tucson and open this donut shop it's gonna be great and i was like okay (laughs) here we go that's when you know Tucson's on the up. Like, what are people about with donut shops here? Because it, it, think of the profit. It's like having a pizza joint. You pay, fi- you pay like 25, 50 cents to make a pizza and you sell it for $15, $20. Yeah, but how do we feel about like designer donuts? Is that the trend? Are we? Because no, clearly trend. he's from Los Angeles, not, you know, to speak bad against Los Angelinos. Yeah. You guys are cool. You're, you're hip. Your food fads yeah, yeah, yeah. are definitely up the top, you know, yeah. for me personally. But designer donuts in Tucson. Yeah. Maybe designer like tamales. Well, it's whatever is Instagrammable is in. So like a donut. If it looks better, then it's gonna be yeah, it's gonna be good. I don't know. I think a tamale looks pretty good. Tamales are cool, but how are you gonna decorate it? How are you gonna make it so they can pull out of that dirty, greasy wrapper and then be like, yes? I think it's really about the reveal of the inside for the tamale. Okay. I think that's like kind of the magic within. The tamale. And I think that's a great segue right now. Oh. The magic within the tamale. Okay. To redirecting to... Am I the tamale? You're the tamale. Ty the tamale? Ty tamale Ty Besh. <laughs> Tucson tamale Ty Besh. Okay, yeah. I, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to copyright that and get the shirt. You have to. With, like, with your face on it. <laughs> and you're like holding a tamale in one hand and like maybe a fork in the other. Yes seems pretty reasonable well can i jump ahead really quick can i just go all the way in yeah because you reminded me yeah i just told um a good friend of ours who will be unnamed um yesterday he's in he's in town he was a dj he is a dj still um but uh, i just told him yesterday that for the one of the projects i'm presenting here in tucson it's going to have uh stickers for promotion like a, a month beforehand, I'm going to go to the local sticker shop and I'm going to give them uh, digital copies of everyone's face that's a DJ in the project that I interviewed and they're going to put those faces on stickers and I'm going to pass those out in Tucson and be like, don't forget to watch a documentary and it's going to be these DJ's faces. And like with a date and yeah. a place and a time and like <laughs> yeah. maybe a QR code. Yeah, Tra- it's like trading cards. It's yeah. their stickers. it's like Pokemon cards. Yeah, like oh here, here's the, you know, the DJ... Shelby Athagia rookie card. Like, this is her rookie card, yeah. <laughs> My rookie card? Like a wild card? Somebody's got to be a wild card. Yeah, I don't Whoa. know. Who would it be? 
I think it'd be that guy, if, if I had to choose a wild card, I interviewed a guy here in Tucson, he, he or they, sorry, go by Jasper. Oh my gosh, so Yeah, they are gone. Um, he's, I, I would say they, I keep correcting myself. Correct, correct pronouns. Yeah, yeah. they are, are since gone from Tucson, which is too bad. Totally. Like many people, they've moved on. I mean, that's kind of a common theme. You know, we've all at some point kind of picked up and left. And, mm. you know, for various reasons, too. I feel like it's, you know, you're called to do a certain project or a certain job or mm. you just, like, want to experience something new yeah. or travel. I think traveling has been kind of a most reason why people have left, which I'm totally cool with. Yeah. It's like, just go find yourself. And you're you know? about to do that once the kitchen's done in your yeah. van. gosh. <laughs> this is taking forever, you know? And, like... I'm so I'm trying to be so patient because I can just see it done. Yeah. And like I'm just like man, but like working with contractors, mm. you know, contractors like they don't. They're on their own. They're on their schedule. own schedule. Yeah. Like you can't getting a hold of them is very interesting. So it's just yep. testing my patience, and it's so ironic because you would think that the last leg of the journey would yeah. be like you're so gung ho, not the most frustrating part. Yeah. But, you know, here we are. Well, okay. Can I apply this again to one of the things I'm doing in Tucson? Yeah. So. And we'll talk, we can talk about this later, but suffice it to say, I'm interviewing more people for a different project. And during one of these interviews, this guy said that he has this theory that there are the 90 percenters, and most of us are 90 percenters in the world, where you will work up to the the 90th percentile of whatever you're trying to accomplish, and then you'll give up, or you'll find a reason to stop. And if you think about it, 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 I think it it happens to me a lot, happens to a lot of people, but you'll get right up to the end, and you just can't find a way to just push over to completion man i wonder how that the is 90 percenters Be, i'm sure you you don't have that it's, i don't have that problem as much you yeah. don't have that problem as much <laughs> i mean i've never i'm like surprised to hear this from you just yeah. knowing you i'm like that doesn't sound like you though <laughs> but i mean it's good to be woke about yeah yeah, yeah. you know other people's unfortunate we've all been there you we know have, like yeah. i remember high school i just you might know this as well i just got access to my old facebook you reactivated. I, well, it's it, I someone hacked it when I was in high school, and so I couldn't log back into it. Oh. And I haven't tried ever since because I, I went through like months of being like, Facebook, come on, this is me, it's me. And they're like, no, you can't. And so I just gave up on it. Mm-hmm. And and then I, I remember gaining access to it again, I think in 2013 or so. Right. And then I lost again. Like it got hacked again. People just want to hack yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's crazy. They're well, I'm the only Tyler Besh in the world at the moment. Got I've it. looked in every place. Like I'm the only one, which is the, which is a problem. It's pretty neat. So though. yeah, and uh, actually, that reminds me. When I was in New York back in 20, this is right after I came back from Europe. Um, I was in New York, and I got a phone call from whatever number it was. I answered, and it was one of those IRS scams, right? And it was before it was a thing at the time. This is this is like 2016. It was before like everyone's like, hey, they're doing these phone scams. Right. And so I was obviously hesitant. They were like, hey, this is the IRS, like. You have some problems with your whatever. And I was like, oh, that's fair because I, I never did my taxes the right way when I was younger. I mean, who does? Let's yeah. be honest. And it was for a business. And so, yeah. like, I wasn't reporting the way I should have in terms of, like, keeping all the reports in order and stuff. And so I was like, yeah, I know. Sorry. And so they already had me hooked because, like, I knew I wasn't doing them right. And then here's the weirdest part is they had my current address, uh, my social security number, um, and a few other things to basically verify that, like, I was like, oh, this is the IRS. They have all my information. Oh my and I was like, okay. And then so from right then, they were like, you know, if you, if you want to solve this problem, like, you got you to, gotta, like, write us a check and, like, go to your bank and then have them, like, uh, do a cashier's check for us. Cashier's yeah. Oh and I was gosh. like, well, I was like, yeah, that's legit. The cashier's check, I guess, like, it's protected. And so I, I was very convinced that, I, I, like, my taxes were all messed up. And I even missed a year. I remember I missed a year of taxes. And so I was getting fined for it. And I was like, yeah, well, here they go. Like, this is what happens. And so uh, I, I went to Bank of America at the time. I wrote the check and I, and I sent it off to them. And then literally right after I did it, I was like, that didn't seem right. <laughs> that wasn't right. And then so. The, it was uh, only afterwards yeah, did but, I know. And here, here's how good they were back then. They're not even that good now, I've noticed. But um they found a way to access an emergency number. So when I was trying to call like my mom or like my my like uh, my lawyer, I was like, did, did I just do something wrong? What's going on? I, I kept getting an incoming call from 911 and it would block me from being able to text and to call. 
And so I was like, oh my God, they're like blocking me from using my phone. And they did that for 10 minutes because they probably wanted to wait for the cashier's check to clear. But I, sure enough, I went to Bank of America and I was like, I think it just got scammed. They're like, yeah, we canceled it. You're fine. Oh and I was my like, oh okay. goodness. <laughs> what a story. Yeah, it was wild. I was literally running around in New York and I was like, oh my God, I just got scammed out of $500. Like what is going on? And, and I was like, the, the blocks are huge in New York. And right. I was like, Bank of America's only a block away. And it took me like 20 minutes to run to Bank of America. I'll be like, cancel that jack, Don't cancel do it. it. Yeah, there's construction and like everyone's just staring at their phone even back then. Yeah, it was wild. Wait, like, so what were you doing in New York? Oh, that was, so right when I got back from traveling Europe, uh, a really good Michigan friend from mine was starting this business. It's a crazy business. It's like a, like a sex toy, a lingerie, Ooh. but for women, like based so it's business. Like women based business yes. for yeah. women, by women. Yeah, like women okay. strong, like feel good with your body and stuff. Um, way before Goop or whatever it is now. <laughs> goop. Yeah, Goop. Gwyneth. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So this this gal that I knew from Michigan, she went out there and she wanted to start a business in New York, and so she was like, Hey, I'm I'm having this big photo shoot to kind of launch it. Do you want to come and do behind the scenes video, interview me, and that'll be like the the Kickstarter type like you know, support us, invest in us, here's our new business. And I was like, yeah. And so I literally, I flew into Toronto, I got to Detroit, and then I went, I drove straight to New York. Yeah, and then, which is funny, because after that, I drove straight to Tucson. I didn't go back to Michigan. You just bypassed. Yeah, I was like, no, I, I'm not going back to Michigan. Wait, so so you went Europe, Detroit, Yeah. and then drove to New York, stayed yeah. there for X amount of time. Yep. And then you came to Tucson. Drove up to Boston to pick up these dudes I had just hung out with in England when I was there. Because okay. they flew into to the U.S. And then drove them down through the south to Tucson. Took us like six or seven days just like seeing different stuff. Right. We stayed with this woman in, in Austin, Texas that had a pig, a pet pig. So cute. All right. Yeah, um, pigs are cute. Yeah, are, also very normal yeah. for Austin, Texas. And uh, and then I got here in Tucson because basically when I, when I was leaving New York and I was driving with them, I was like... You guys, I'll drive you up to Tucson because I've now decided I'm not trying to go back to Detroit. It's not for me. I want to go back to Tucson. And so they were like, yeah, we'll just drop us in Tucson. We'll get a bus to California. And so we did a little road trip together. And That's super Yeah, and exciting. then that's how I ended up here in 2016 is like just this is where it starts. So what made you not want to go back to Detroit? This has happened to me a few times where I've been either in Michigan or in Detroit itself as an artist. And I'm like, it doesn't feel one, it doesn't feel right. It never does, no matter how long I've stayed there or around there. And, and two, they had the, the boom, the renaissance, they call it. Right, the re-gentrification yeah. and, and so, all that kind of stuff. Although, like, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm fit for that movement um, in terms of, like, financially and, like, I'm a metro kid, you know, privileged and stuff. It, I, I didn't like seeing it happening around me, right. although I could have taken advantage of it. And so... I was like, nah, it's, I, I'd rather just skip You this. just didn't want to participate. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, which is fair. Yeah. You know, that's definitely some, like, kind of reflections I'm seeing here yep. in this particular town. So. That's what brought me to Europe in the first place. I was living in Detroit, and, and I saw it happening, and I was like, nah. Yeah. And so I just went and traveled instead. And how long were you traveling in Europe? That was six months. Yeah. And any particular reason why you did it? Or you just were like, were you creating anything? or was Yes. It okay. So in Detroit, there was, like, a lull in my work. I, I was doing stuff with a production company. I was doing wedding videos. That was great. Actually, what is kind of cool, though, about the wedding videos is I got to do a wedding video for, their names are Tanith and Charlie. They were Olympic figure skaters together. And they had a secret marriage. They didn't want the, the press to know. So they had a secret marriage in Michigan where they were from, and I got to shoot it because the company hired me to shoot it for them. And so I was at this wedding in this beautiful botanical garden in Metro Detroit, and like there was only like 60 people there. It was like their, their closest friends and family. And it was so beautiful. They obviously spent a ton of money. Right, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but even after that, I still was like, there wasn't any work coming in. I wasn't inspired in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm, the, the project that I wanted to do when I was traveling um, was bas basically to build a web. I was like, I'm gonna go to Europe. I'm gonna get a, 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 a rail pass. I was 25 at the time, so it's cheap. And I'm gonna interview people and I'm gonna ask them to tell me to go interview somewhere, someone else somewhere else. I was like, do you have a friend or someone that you know that does something cool? Like get me in contact with them, I'll take the, the train. Like I'll go interview them. Wow. The idea was to build that web in Europe for as long as possible, as long as I wanted to. Um, but then of course, a month into the trip, 
I got mugged in Brussels and my camera got stolen and stuff. And so, yeah, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was wild. Of yeah, course. Yeah. So it became more of like, oh, yeah, you get to travel and just experience culture now. Yeah, now yeah instead here. of working. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, that's interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, sure. but I mean, I think it's a really great idea to bring that like you can like have kind of a way like a web to trace everything mm -hmm. everybody and everything to each other like a link yeah you know? yeah wow. imagine doing that in tucson yeah because well, everyone's like be two bananas. or three degrees at the most right like everyone knows of everybody here so like I, I i might try to resurface the the projects like or whatever like a similar idea or style. yeah here in yeah. tucson because it'd be so much easier here i feel like i do that already I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> in, in a lot of facets, you do. I mean, you've worked on so many different projects that just kind of interloop people here. But before I hop into that, you mm. said something earlier that just kind of like sparked a question in me. You said like you weren't getting inspired or getting any mm. influence from being in Detroit. Was there ever a moment where you were? Did, no. Has Detroit ever inspired you as an no, artist? No, and, and I think it's fascinating to think about that because you've been to Detroit. Yeah. So it's a beautiful city. There's very old, incredible buildings. The architecture is lovely. Um, in, in terms of the, the energy in the city, there's a really interesting energy as well um, that, that I identify with. It's, there's a lot of creators, a lot of makers there. Sure. Um, and uh, a lot of people just trying to just like have a better life, you know, just while living cheap and building something. And so I thought that's who I was. Um, but yeah, not not once being in Detroit where I was like, oh, I want to do this or like, oh, man, this inspired me to do this. I, I never had that ever in Detroit. So the city never inspired you. The people. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you just saw them as other creators yeah. and were like, cool for them. They're mm -hmm. doing their thing. But so you've always kind of had this like curiosity and drive to just be outside of where you're from. Yeah. So Europe, you went and traveled and attempted oh, yeah. something really yeah. cool, which <laughs> Potentially may resurface. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you might get mugged on the south side of Tucson. And yeah. It, you know, it might just real. not be for you. You never know. <laughs> so you go to Europe, you come back, you go to New York, you do this thing, you get tax scammed, mm. you drive to Tucson with some random folks. Oh, yeah. And they hop on a bus, go to California. Yeah. And then you're here. It's 2016. Yes. And then what happens? So, end of 2016, I, I believe I showed up here in uh, September. Um, and the first thing I did when I got here, I was like, where's the house music? Like, I, I just traveled Europe. Got it. House and techno, they have a flourishing scene there, as you know. So wait, you, you pause. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you heard house and techno more in Europe than you did in Detroit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And just to be clear to our <laughs> listeners out here, <laughs> I'm triggered. Yeah. Just, just to be clear to our listeners here, <laughs> techno music is from Detroit. Yes. Like, it is originally born yes. and bred in Detroit, which is why I've been there. Yeah. And so I just find that a very interesting... Well, and here's here was my experience with it. It's it's definitely um, like it, what, what people would have considered the boys club. I found in Detroit, if you weren't connected with the right people, you would never know where any of the stuff was except for TV Lounge. Like, or uh, Detroit Wine Bar, I think it was called, or Motor City Wine Bar. Two venues that I knew had really good underground type house and techno uh, like scenes and, and shows. Anything else, the stuff that, you'd, that I've found here in Tucson, like either house parties or small stuffs in a, a gallery or like solar and all these kind of places here, all the venues are downtown here in a two mile radius. Sure. There, if you don't know the right people, you're never gonna find it because Detroit is like, 30 San Francisco's or whatever the what it, you can fit San Francisco and a different city inside of Detroit it's a giant city wow. and there's too much and it's 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 so sprawling that if you, yeah like I said if you don't know where the thing is happening you can't just be like driving around looking for it. yeah looking for where the cars are going and look, listening for music it's not going to happen yeah. um that's what I loved about Tucson when I got here was the funny thing was I was like where's this music I couldn't find anything on Instagram or on on the internet or Facebook or whatever I was like, where is the scene here? And then that's actually what led me to Days and Confused. It's the only thing I found besides house yoga or whatever it was, hot house yoga. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you found Days and Confused on Instagram? Facebook? It was, I believe it was Facebook. 
because I was like doing all the hashtags, like typing in like Tucson techno, Tucson house, house music in Tucson, like all of it. I was so desperate. And then I forgot what it was, but yeah, something got me connected to Dazed. And then at the time I was working uh, for like this defunct news station. Uh, so a company in Tucson bought uh, public access. It was up right, for grabs. Right, right. And so uh, this company bought it and they were just looking for people to make content. Um, I saw a flyer that was basically telling me this. And so I went to them and they were like, yeah, you, like you've made journalism type videos for many years now. Do the same thing for us because we just need content. And so my, my first outlook at Dazed was I'm going to make a small five to ten minute like, profile of who are these people, why are they doing it, they're the only ones in town doing it that I can tell, what's their deal? That was the, right. the inception of it. Years later, obviously, now, yeah, yeah it's, it's been a different story. So I never knew that. Like, you you only had the intention of just making a small spotlight. Really small. And when you found Dazed and Confused, were you looking because this was in your interest on doing a project, or did you just want to find the music? It was a little bit of both. Okay. Because... The, the way I did things, I, I did journalism from 2009 to 2000. Uh, I basically stopped in 2015. So I worked for newspapers, all the universities I went to, and then freelanced as well. And so I, I've always found that, like, whatever I'm interested in, that's probably the best thing to make a video of anyway. Because I'm, I'm seeking something. I, I'm, I'm going to be way more excited and interested in terms of asking questions, figuring out why. And so, yeah, that's why it made sense to just be like, who are these people? Let's make a little video anyways. This way I'll get involved with them in, in, in the process. Right. Yeah. And so it was just supposed to be mm -hmm. a short clip. Yeah. <laughs> and then what changed your mind? Well, what, once I, there was a party at a hookah bar. That was the first one I saw. Yeah, that was my bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that put it at the hookah bar. Yeah, that was wild. Like, I mean, I've never been to a hookah bar house and techno party, so that's great. It, was, it actually wasn't terrible. Yeah, it, it was, was a great it was party. Decorated. There's people from out of town that, that came and played. And so when I saw that, what I, what I ended up seeing during that was like the crew of people that were, were running it because I was there beforehand shooting of everyone setting up. I saw how, how connected they were to each other, like how much fun they had together um, as a crew. And so I was like, oh, and then the more I talked to some of the DJs and the people, they explained to me that literally right before I got to Tucson, months before in the same year, there were a couple parties that like that went off like underground, like totally just like Detroit style like parties and I just missed them. And and basically this this scene was basically like plateauing from this this giant explosion that just happened. And I was like, okay, well, this would be kind of interesting to follow. Like what's gonna happen next? Yeah. And that's when I started going to all the dazed parties. And then from there it literally built its own web of okay, well now there's something happening at Congress with a different crew. Now there's something happening at our bar with a different crew. And so that so dazed introduced me to all of these other people and what they were doing. And I was like, oh, well, this is how you find stuff is you just have to to find the one thing and, and then everyone else knows each other, so it's fine. Yeah, so yeah. like again, another kind of showing of of your work, like what fuels your work. And yeah. that's like this interconnectedness, like kind of drawing connections and parallels between individuals and communities. Mm. Like how close are we really? And I don't know if you do that consciously or subconsciously and you don't have to answer that, but like that's it seems to be a common theme. Well, I, I'll respond to it in this way. I, I've i tried working in Los Angeles a few times um, because that's where the film industry is. That that would make the most sense for me to be there, um, to get work, to further my career, to have better opportunities to do bigger stuff. Uh, every time I'm there, it's kind of like Detroit. I'm very uninspired by the city. I don't understand the game that you have to play to, to get ahead, you know, in terms of the industry and making the connections and like being a certain way or whatever. I, d I didn't understand that either. And so I, I had a realization years ago where I was like, I, I'm, I know I'm not going to make the big movies because I don't want to go through that. Um, and I, and I also don't want to be there because behind the scenes has been kind of my thing now. It's like, that's what I enjoy doing because it's, it's telling stories still, yeah. but I didn't want to be there doing that either. Cause I, it, it would mean I have to be there. And so, <laughs> yeah, and so basically I was like, instead, I'd rather just focus on what I've been doing for whatever, eight years now, which is telling other people's stories for them. And so interviewing people is like, it, anytime I have a chance to interview someone, I'll take it. 
It's it's my favorite thing to do. And yeah, if, if you look at all the work I've, I've done, there's maybe two videos I've made where I haven't, it's not based around interviews. Yeah. So yeah, very much so. And I feel too, like just as somebody who knows you personally, like in observing you with not just how you interact with me, but observing you interact with other people like you you just naturally go for like asking Mm. good questions and harboring good conversation and so I think that that kind of quality is something that not only speaks through your art but like it really is something that you do in real life like yeah person yeah no thank you And, and like I think the reason behind that is there's two sides of me that I've noticed there's I don't mind being quiet um I'm very comfortable with like if you're with someone and there's nothing to say, I don't mind not saying anything. <laughs> that's, that's fine with me is like, if there needs to be silence between two people, yeah. for me, it's not uncomfortable, it's not awkward silence. Right. I enjoy it because you're still with the person. Right. On the other side of that, if we are gonna talk, I'd rather not do the small talk part of it. It's like, I'd rather just actually get to know you, get to know your opinions and your experiences because I mean, that's, that's what moves everyone forward in terms of knowledge that can inspire them. I mean, there's, that, uh, there's so many things that if you actually just give someone the trueness of yourself, that it'll help them through their own stuff. Yeah, it's like a really philosophical way of being because, like, when you, you know, present people with these questions that you're, like, asking, they might not have thought about that mm. before. Mm. observed it physically and then in your work as well and being interviewed by you as well like that really shines through yeah well and and so a good example of of what you're saying is right now i'm building a business in tucson yeah yeah because it totally applies (laughs) to what i'm doing right now so the idea has been i had this idea when uh it was 2013 i was working in florida and in the same, in the very same year, both of my, my mother's father and my mother's mother both passed away. And I was like, oh, that sucks. And I wasn't there for either one of them. Oh, I was out of Michigan, right. And so I, I would come back for the funerals. And the worst part was when I'm talking to all these people at the funerals, none of them knew like real personal stories about my grandparents. So you were going through your normal motions of yeah. being with people and asking the right questions right. and nobody could come up with. No one knew because they themselves didn't bother to ask the questions. And I was too young to care. Like when I was growing up, of course, like my grandmother took care of me in the summers. My parents both worked. My grandfather was there as well. And I didn't care to ask them about their life. I was too young to know you're supposed to do that. Yeah. And so by the time I knew that, it was too late. And so that that kind of inspired this idea. I was like, who else is not doing this? Sadly, it's kind of our culture in the U.S. to kind of be removed from our, our family. It's kind of taboo to be, like, uh, intimate with your family, in, in, in the U.S. at least. Um, and the more I've noticed that, I'm like, well, there's a lot of people that are probably just shoving their, grand, their parents, grandparents into these homes and being like, yeah, I'll come visit you every couple months, like, until you die. Right. And so I saw that firsthand when I was working for a moving company that was doing senior living, independent living home stuff. And I was like talking to these, these elders and they would never get visited ever. Like, yeah, it's so sad. And so, uh, I finally picked back up on the idea just this past year. I was like, all right, it's time to do this. Like I'm done running around. And so the idea has been, how can I get in contact with as many elders as possible, interview them with video or audio if they're not comfortable with with video. But the idea with the video is so people a hundred years from now can see, their great, great, whatever, telling a story or talking about their life in, in, in the style that you're talking about. It, it's just me having a conversation with them being like, tell me about your life. What was childhood like? Like in, in the, the, the best part of the interviews is usually they're an hour and a half to two hours, maybe 10 or 15 times during the interview, I'll hear them say, oh, I never thought about that. I forgot about that. Wow. And it, it, like they'll have a memory that kind of is oh connected gosh. by just having this conversation. So yeah, it is, it's therapeutic. Yeah. I, I think it's it's pretty good for their health. It's, it seems like it's connecting stuff in there. Totally connecting dots yeah. and wires that they yeah. need to dust off. So that's the idea. Is like that's kind of the next step is taking it to that level where it's it's almost like an, an initiative. I'm trying to build in Arizona specifically where it's like 
we got to preserve these people's stories before it's too late. So now I know you recently went up to Phoenix to do something mm-hmm. involved with this project, which is called the Late Life, Late Life Archive. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you went up to Phoenix and you spoke to the, the mayor? Yeah. <laughs> I went to the mayor's office. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, the governor's office. The governor's yeah, office. Yeah, not the mayor. The mayor of Arizona. The, the governor of Arizona, D.C. Um, uh, so I, I I contacted him. I, I went straight to him. I was like, I'm going to see if he responds to me. Yeah, and, yeah. of course, I got his secretary as, as a response. And they're like, we love the idea. Um, you can't meet with the governor. <laughs> you can't just do that. And I was like, okay. And then and so I was like, well, what, what should I do next? And, like, we're going to hook, hook you up with someone in the governor's office that will like be able to answer your questions and then push you in the right direction. And so I went and uh, met this woman named Grace, had a, like a, a great talk with her, and she actually put me in line. It's called, uh, I forgot the actual name of the department, but what's interesting is they're transitioning out of the governor's office to a different sector in the state of Arizona. And so in the meantime, they're not doing anything in terms of what I'm talking about. Right. And so I got hooked up with their department and I basically have to wait until they've transitioned as a department to a different department before I can be like, hey, let's make this a thing. And so I'm just waiting on them. In right. the meantime, I'll do it on my own. Sure, but sure. yeah. So so this partnership mm-hmm. or this support or whatever it is you want to call it, like what does that look like? for your project? Like, what are they going to help with and how are you going to be able to bring this to more people? Yeah. So when I, when I did my research for the project, before I started this, I was like, I want to know who's doing it themselves first. Um, there's a few different companies that are doing it that I could find. Um, one is a Ted talk and, but they don't do anything it, in my opinion, that's personal enough, like my approach to conversations. So one, they do, uh, a, a journalistic style one. They'll literally send a reporter to the elder in, in a home or something, and they'll basically talk to them and just take some notes, just like a reporter would for a story. And they'll write like a page about like, here's this person, and here's all these highlights from their life. But and nothing like kind of yeah, personal. Yeah, like or no depth. like everyday normal stuff. I mean, that basically sounds like an obituary yeah, already. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. And so yeah, so that was I was like no, and then I found the next one, which is closer what I, what I'm what I'm trying to do is they do like a, almost like a yearbook or like a, a flip book where they'll, but this is the sad part. They just send the elders emails. So they send emails with like 20 questions and they continue to send them emails for like six months. And so the, the, the elders are supposed to like just respond to these emails or like get someone to help them. Yeah. And then they'll take those stories, put them in print in a book and then get, get photos or whatever from the family and then make it a cute little, which is, it, it's a decent idea, yeah. but like how like impersonal for the, the elder in the family, right. it's like, here's another reason not to go visit them. Right. We'll just send them emails. Um, my father works in healthcare. He's, he has for many years. And so I, I, I've talked to him about this. I, I've seen it firsthand. Like, yeah, it's, people tend to, to, to be okay with removing themselves from their like mother, father, grandparents when they're old enough where it's like, oh, now they're kind of like work for me. Sure. And so it's, that's the sad part. And so the reason I went to the governor's office is now that I've seen this is kind of more in depth, it's more personal. It's obviously way harder to monetize and to grow because it's, it's, it requires way more time yeah. to do the interviews. It, re, it requires way more people to do all this kind of stuff. And so that's when I realized very, very early on, I can't do this on my own as much as I'd love to kind of hoard the idea and build it. And like, this is mine. Um, if I actually believe in the project, and this is kind of me talking to myself, I was like, if I actually believe in this idea, it can't be mine only. And so that's why I've been trying to expand to at least the state of Arizona to see if they can kind of make it like a a PSA from the governor, where it's like, we're trying to get as many elders to do this, to pass on to their families. And if if I see that happen, at least in this state, then then that's fair enough. Yeah, I I would say that you probably did a great job. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that was a mosquito hawk, wasn't it? Yeah. Like flying around, I'm afraid they're gonna try and mess with my hair. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta be careful out here. Yeah, you just never know out here, man. And I can't tell if this is dead or alive. Do you know if it's dead or alive? To be honest, like the bottom of the plant. Oh yeah, it looks good down there. Pretty chill. Yeah. But, you know, I just don't really know what's going on up here. But yeah. It's, it's, it's spring. Like spring is coming, in in the desert, things grow. So believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, things flourish here. Honestly, I don't know. We you, we can what we'll do is we'll update the podcasters. Like I'll come back in three months from now, take a photo of this section. In the, in the podcast notes. 
Yeah, in the I notes, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. It I'll include it in the notes, yeah. yeah. I'll put this in the notes for later, the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You gotta include this photo. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Well, can we include um, uh, one more thing in, in the podcast notes and yeah. end the podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in two weeks from That's now, right. I have this project, which is also one of the projects, kind of like the Late Life Archive, where I had the idea, actually while I was traveling in Europe. So the idea was, I, was, I remember specifically when I had the idea, I was walking on a bridge in uh, like outside of London in whatever town it was, and I was like thinking about dancers because I've worked a lot with dancers in the past. And I was like, dancers never use their voice, obviously. They're always like expressing words or an idea through their movement. And it might have been a stupid thought at the moment. I was like, why don't they use their words? Like, I, I want people to talk, like, obviously, because I interview people. Yeah, and you enjoy the yeah. questioning. <laughs> right. And so I was like, how am I going to get dancers to talk? And so that was kind of the, the goal for a project. Right. And by the time I got home many months later, I was like, the project is going to be, I'm going to interview a dancer. I'm going to make them get personal with me, um, have them tell a story from their life as be five minutes or less, because we're going to then give that story to another dancer, a friend of theirs or someone they know, or I just, I go find someone else and they're going to improv dance to that story. So I'm going to let them listen to it once on the second time. They have to just remember the story and dance to it. And I record it with video. Wow. And so I had that, I, that was 2016, I had the idea. When I went to New York, I interviewed one person. I interviewed one person when I came back in Phoenix. And then, um, but either one of them didn't have someone to do the other part for theirs. So they kind of just fell apart. Um, and they were very personal stories. And I was like, well, do you want someone that I know to do it? And they're like, probably not. Yeah, and because they didn't sense. trust it. Yeah, right. and so I was like, that's fine. And so... I, I basically, for the next couple of years, I would just take advantage of traveling around the U.S. I was in Oklahoma visiting a family. I got a dancer in Oklahoma to do it. And then I was in San Francisco, uh, I think, just traveling. And I got a dancer to do this story from Oklahoma because they knew each other. Oh, they used wow. to Yeah, they used to dance yeah, together. Yeah. Now they're on opposite sides of the country. Um, and uh, freaking, what's it called? Uh, Who's the next one? Yeah, Oklahoma, San Francisco, and then from there I did, ah, then I was in Detroit, and I got two dancers that, that like, danced together still in Detroit to tell their stories and dance together, um, and then while I was working in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, I got a guy to do it, but I wasn't there long enough to get his friend to do the other part of it, so that kind of fell apart as well, so I have three out of the, um, how many people is that? That's, like, ten people. yeah. I, For, including the original. Yeah. Right. So three of those people were automatically just kind of put aside. Right. And so what I'm doing now is I'm taking that split screen idea. So the video is going to be the person telling the story. Next to them is simultaneously someone dancing to the story. And then I have this guy that plays in the Tucson Symphony Orchestra. His name is John Lee. Cool guy. He was on Lamestream with John you. Lee. Yeah, I forgot he played I, with yeah, you. Yeah, I played with John oh, Lee. Oh, he's great. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I got him and he's going to play live violin to the stories. Wow. Yeah, so I'm presenting it downtown. Um, and this is kind of what this is what Tucson has been for me now that I've gotten back for, what, the third or fourth time living here, is I've had these ideas. I've started them. I don't want to be the 90% person. Yeah. I've, I've been working on these for many years. It's time to just, just cut off, take whatever I have, and present it to people. Let people see it. Like, I have many friends in the, in the film industry or just in creative industries where they're like, it's not perfect yet. And so then they never release whatever they're working on. I'm the same way with my work, but it, at some point you just got to be like, well, am I going to let them see it or not? Yeah. And so I'm taking four of the, the dancers, um, presenting those ideas, and then maybe if, if people react to it in a good way, then I, I might consider pushing it forward sure. and, and making the project bigger and... And stuff like that. I kind of like that approach yeah. because you just show it all the work that you've done now, call it what it is, and if you get some good feedback, yeah. then it's like, okay, yeah, maybe this was worth it, or maybe you know, you get mugged in Brussels yeah. and get your <laughs> camera taken from you, yeah, and you lose all the footage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the other, the other part of that is, so I have the dance thing here, and I also saw that it was time to finally present the documentary. Yeah, 
Daze Talking. The Daze, yeah. Underground dance music. Yeah, which became just a whatever, like everything got a documentary. It's like an all-encompassing. Yeah, but what's cool is I'm basically done with the edits. Um, I'm I'm getting local musicians to give me their songs that are not copywritten. Um, And so I can use them, yeah. And uh, that was basically end of 2016 into the beginning of 2018. Mm -hmm. And now here we are in early 2020, and already I've seen many of the buildings that these things used to happen in are knocked down or closed. Many of the people that used to be in the scene that I interviewed or that I saw as DJs, producers, venue owners, whatever, they're gone. They just left Tucson. Um, so I think it's a really interesting interesting time to show the documentary to be like, here's what used to happen a couple of years ago, and now it's completely different already. Because right. Tucson is one of those places. It just changes so often. It is. And I kind of want to draw that back to like the ori- one of the original questions I asked. So you weren't necessarily inspired by, by Detroit. Mm. Are you inspired by Tucson? Oh, yeah. It's one of those things where it's funny because people talk about Tucson as the vortex where it's so comfortable here and so cheap and it's such good living that that's what will draw you back. You keep getting pulled back into the vortex. For me, I, I can live anywhere. I, I've proved that to myself already. Mm-hmm. We didn't even talk about how I was in Asia for seven yeah, months. Yeah, you were in Asia for yeah. seven, yeah, so like, seven months before yeah. all of that went down. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, and so like I love living in different places anyways. I can make friends anywhere, I hope to be the case in the future as well. Um, and, but Tucson for me is, is what you're saying, is that inspiring uh, landscape, is the inspiring people, uh, is the fact that you put those two things aside, now you're making work because you're inspired. Once you've made it, you can present it here. People are willing to watch it. And you're comfortable doing yeah, it. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mind if, if, it's, if it's a bust, if people don't like what I've made. Um, and, then, and then in the same line of thought is the people are supportive. So whether or not they like it, they're still going to make sure that it gets to the point where they'll see it and, and you, you have a place to show it, you have a place to do whatever, you have you know, people that will drive you around or do things for free or like this person that's this, this materials or whatever it is, like everyone's trying to help each other out here make their stuff because everyone's in the same position where everyone's trying to make some, something here if you're, if you're in that circle and they know that it's, it's hard to make stuff here because there's no... Um, there's no industry for it. Right. There's no market to actually make money from it. So everyone's kind of working for free almost here or, you know, for, like for a passion, whatever. And so it's kind of like a give and a take. You know, you're going to take a bunch of resources from this person to help your project be done. And then you'll give back your stuff when it's time for theirs. Yeah. And so that's why I come back to Tucson. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I can personally resonate with that. I've done the whole leave and come back thing a million times and Mm. truly seen what Tucson's all about in terms of this community and I find it so interesting because you you speak this way of such a a giving community and a safe community and who you naturally are as a person with your particular craft and questioning and interviewing and getting to know people like it just kind of gravitates to a place like this where you're like well we're already interconnected so how can I just kind of dive Mm. deeper into that and you did with your project and you're still doing it in the state of Arizona as a whole kind of showcasing Tucson with with your late 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 life archive (laughs) it's hard to say it is hard to say it is that's what I like about it yeah yeah it's nice the LLA can we yeah is it the the, the la (laughs) yeah (laughs) but you are you're you're bringing this um this like personality and this personal interest which happens to coincide with just this general need and desire to be connected Mm. as humans and as individuals and I think that that's like a a brilliant art in itself in in all I hope that comes out of that is I hope to when when you were saying that this is what I thought of is I hope that all this stuff that I'm doing that is kind of based on like being personal with people um going in depth with people and giving them your time um, that's kind of what it's all about too is like I'm giving these people my time as well to interview them um, that right there I hope that grows in Tucson past th- whatever's happening right now where it's like I think a lot of people are worried about is Tucson going to be genuine in a year or two when all these things are coming up and all these new business like businesses come in um, I hope this is one of those things that pushes through into yeah we still care about people here in Tucson like although it's seeing a new stage of growth in terms of business yeah yeah and it's a it's a great thing too like documentaries and all these kinds of things I think are just really meant to preserve you know no matter what topic you choose like we were trying we were trying to do is like capture a moment and be like hey when we look back on this 
like this is what it was going to be like. Mm. I mean, with the elderly or with our dance community in every sort of way or, you know, people that you're traveling with in Europe or in Asia. Mm. And what did you do in Asia, by the way? (laughs) I have no idea. Well, you know, (laughs) so the great thing about Asia was um, I had this weird plan that I was going to do one year in Asia and one year between Australia and New Zealand because that's, that's what you're right. supposed to do, yeah, right? Totally like you're already kind of there. So you might as well, when you're done with Asia, go to the, the islands and figure that out. Cause especially it's very easy for us to get a visa to do that. Right. Um, what, what happened along the way though, is, um, I, it became less of let me sightsee, let me go to all these places you're supposed to in Asia as, as a tourist. And it became more, where's the best place to, to be in the forest, to be, in, in the greenery, to be in the quiet, to be with people that um, aren't like me. Those are all things that, those are my new goals while I was in Asia after a couple months of being like, all right, why am I actually here? And it became basically, in the entirety of the trip became introspection in what has happened in my life, what have I gone through, how do I treat people, like what are the reasons behind all of those things? And I've never reflected on any of that. I've, I've always been like Sonic, you know, I've just been like running yeah, the whole going. time. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a lot of things that I, I didn't know I was doing or didn't know why I was doing. Um, and so I, I went back to like, you know, my parents' divorce and I went back to, you know, uh, all these d- different surgeries that I had to get when I was young because of sports. And like literally I was in a, 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 an arm cast for om- almost a year and a half because I had two soldier- shoulder surgeries one after the other and so I was just stuck like this for like four months at a time and then in rehab and then another surgery and then in rehab and so it was there's stuff like that it 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 like does something to the way yeah Yeah. and so I dealt with that in Asia and um I I journaled a ton I did a, a bunch of like voice recordings just kind of talking through my stuff um yeah it was fascinating and so it was really weird because every time someone asked me like how was asia like where'd you go show me the pictures like i I have nothing for them i have nothing i'm like i don't know in fact i don't really yeah yeah it's kind of a big deal yeah (laughs) yeah no so like it was a very expensive way of like figuring my shit out is the best way to put it yeah um but i'm glad i did it because i i love tucson i love different cities i've lived in but when you're being stimulated all the time in a city like this, I personally, for myself, I cannot do that kind of reflection. I can't make that kind of change when I'm in a place like this. So I had to do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tucson wasn't clearly right. Detroit definitely wasn't going to be right. And then I can't really mm. think of any other place you listed you've been Oof. that would have inhibited that. So yeah, so you just kind of had to go to a new place and figure it out. Did you get inspired to do any projects when you were there? Or oh, were yeah. You, were you working on something? I, one of the things I wanted to do is I, all the all the stuff I reflected on, um, it kind of inspired me to be like, and you hear this all the time in the media now, right? Because it's like, oh, technology this and like, oh, the economy and oh, the class system. And so it, it always talks about how um, so many people are just being pushed and pushed and, until they break um, by all these things around them. And so I, I kind of want to do a short mini series once I get with the, the proper writer to, to translate my thoughts into like good writing, um, where it'd be like a series of here's pe- like one person dealing with some kind of um, like mental illness or some kind of emotional instability or whatever, all these broken people, you know, cause we're all broken now cause of whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so it'd be following all these different kinds of people and, but they all connect in some way cause they all know each other, but they're all like broken in a different way. And so it's like spotlighting, you know, what the, what life is like for them and then what life is like for them with that other person over there that's broken in a different way, right. you know? So it's like, it's just kind of like slice of life, totally. but like showing our individual, not sugarcoating it. Yeah. 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 Our individual trials and tribulations mm-hmm. and everybody is different. You yeah. Know? While we do still, we are still connected and that can be like kind of a beautiful, like almost romanticized yeah. feeling where you're like, but we're all connected, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, we're all kind of shitty. Yeah. And we all have our own like things. And how do we interact even behind closed doors, mm. which I think would be probably my favorite thing yeah. of that is like seeing yeah. two people <laughs> come together and then they're like, okay, bye. And then yep. they just like fall yeah. apart. Yep. Wow. Cause it happens, mm. you know, I think too often. And I think 
by doing the projects that you do, it can bring to light that kind of conversation mm. between people. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Just kind of like, it's okay, we can talk about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, you'd hope so. Yeah. For sure. Like, look at these real people <laughs> who also happen to be connected. Yep. Yeah. And so who knows? Maybe one day, like years from now, I'll be making like a, a series. You know, I, I want to say film, but... It's probably going to be longer than a film because, you know, episodes of right, one right. season is like four or five hours long. So I, I would hope to be making that in Tucson, not in L.A. or something or Atlanta. Yeah. I'd hope to be in a place where I can still do all that stuff here in Tucson where I'd want to do it instead of like go where, where the work is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely somewhere where you're comfortable and mm-hmm. where it inspires the work. Yeah. Coming like circling right back to that. You yeah. Know? Yeah, you exactly. To, you have to have that and. I think you would be totally held by this community in doing something like that here. Yeah, I'd hope so. Okay, so aside from the project that you're working on yeah. and this potential dream project, yeah. is there anything else that you're kind of striving for right now? So the last thing I have to do, um, and it's not a project, it's uh, I have to go to Poland. And I was about to, but the whole like coronavirus thing. Well, it made flights cheaper. Yeah. So. <laughs> I already have the round trip. I uh. have it. So I'm just trying to decide if I want to go. Got it. Um, for a multitude or, or, or a multitude? Multitude. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's Yeah, correct. that's the word. Yeah, you're totally in. Yeah, for a multitude of reasons, <laughs> I, I don't want to go. I don't think it's the right time. But I've wanted to go because my great-grandfather um, on the best side is from Poland, right above the border to Ukraine. I, I've never been to Poland. I didn't make it when I was there in Europe. And I know all these stories about, you know, him coming over to the U.S., you know, running away from whatever situation and building his life. And and I've met so many people from Poland in my travels now yeah. where I'm like, those two things just make me want to go and see them in their element and then discover, like, my family's roots sure. in this tiny little town. When you look at it on Google Maps, it just has a gas station. And so it's what? like it's all <laughs> listed there as, like, a thing. Yeah, it's like oh I'm sure they have, like, little shops, but it's not listed. It's just a gas station. Great. And so it's a little small town. And that kind of kind of goes with the, the project, the Late Life Archive, is I want to go discover my family's stuff um, in, in more of a, an emotional, um, what, what other word would be like ambient way? Like an energy. I want to be able to go like where my great-grandfather was standing and just be, it, just be there. Yeah. And just be like, just be in the moment there. Be in the space yeah. that that space was right and, and just kind of full circle mm-hmm. i'm not trying to go to ancestry.com and right. see three photos of him and be like oh he was a gardener and <laughs> then he came to the u.s and then now he has kids and so it's like i, I just want to be way more intimate about connecting with people that i've never met sure yeah so kind of taking a little bit of your own mm-hmm. medicine so to speak oh yeah you got to you got to do ha- it yeah you have to you know they say every great shaman has you know, dealt with their own mm. stuff in their own way. So yeah. they could be a shaman too. I feel like if I just continue to grow this a little bit longer. Yeah, guru. Yep. Just grow then. out your pinky nail. Yeah. We'll get you like a <laughs> turban, you know. Well, I mean, I have Lebanese roots as well. Oh. So I have the, I have mostly European. I actually, I'm all European, of course. I have some Italian. I have um, um, Polish mm-hmm. and then Lebanese, which would be considered the Middle East. But it's right there. Yeah. By, yeah. It's just so, so close. It's right there. So, yeah. I, I And I don't like saying the Middle I don't think anyone likes saying Middle East anymore because there's such like a... Super taboo. Yeah. yeah it's just, there's a bad connotation. Like, huh. Yeah, connotation. Like, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, but I look good. I'll, I'll look good with a wrap. I've got the green eyes. I've I got the dark skin. I want one of those, skin. like, chic... Um, like, chic's wear. Yeah. Not, like, chic as in yeah. stylish. Right, I right. mean, like, a chic's <laughs> gown, you know? Yeah. And then you just, like... Ride a camel? Why am yeah. I thinking of a camel? Would you go camo under there, or what would you wear under the chic? You mean commando? Right. Camo? You said camo. Would you, yeah, would you be like... <laughs> you just lift up the sheet, and there's I'm invisible. <laughs> I'm like, you can't see me. Flesh tones, yeah. Like, you can't t- tell if you're wearing something or not. You look like an alien because you have camo. no genitals. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. So you understood, which is good. Yeah, yeah. but commando. Um, I, under the chic. Yeah, it's hot. Dress. This is the Middle East we're talking about. This is desert. Yeah, you know, I think I'd do it. I think I'd do it. Mm-hmm. That's um, why, like, you know, Ireland kilts. Yeah. They do that. Just they get do the that. wind in there. But it's so windy there. Right. Like, how did? There were a lot of accidents. Yeah. That <laughs> 
there's no way that that yeah. went down like where nobody's killed went yeah out. what better way to get personal with someone to get close to someone than seeing them naked because also there's taboo for us it is we can't see anyone naked no like nobody can't do it you post a nipple on facebook and they Hack your profile <laughs> yeah, exactly. and call the IRS. Maybe that's on what you. I did. I have a lot of nipple pics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <damn>. I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, do we have anything else we want to talk about? I have nothing else to promote. Yeah. Yeah. You're self-promoting. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else. <laughs> You want to talk about your childhood? You know, do we need to go there? Yeah, episode two, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> episode two, <laughs> part we'll two. Be back. Okay, well, um, that about concludes the first episode of Friends Interviewing Friends in yes. Another Friend's Backyard, or whatever <laughs> I called it the first time. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was, it was uh, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. By the way, when you asked me to interview you, <laughs> I damn near shit my... I was like, yeah, cool, casual. I'll just interview the interview casual, guy. Like, casual, casual. <laughs> so just I'm, like KXCI, just pretend you're on the radio. Right, I really wasn't trying to think too hard about it. Yeah, so. I'll be over here. Hey, I'm Chris, so... I'm Chris. Chris Miranda. It's I'm me. Chris. <laughs> thanks, anyway, so I'm Chris. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.